Great. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the June at Home. It's lovely to see so many of you. Uh, the weather in London is really beautiful today. I hope it's lovely wherever you are. Um, we will do our best to stick to time today so that you can all go off and enjoy the beautiful weather. Uh, just a reminder, if I can ask you to keep yourselves on mute during the presentations, then that will make sure that everyone can hear. Uh, if you want to say hello, if you have any comments, uh, and if you have any questions, then please do put them in the chat. Uh, we've got time for Q&A after each of the papers and another 10 minutes of Q&A right at the end. And Robin is going to be our Q&A master today, so she will be able to put your, uh, your brilliant questions to our speakers uh, when that comes around. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker and get us started. Okay, so our first speaker is Helen Wild. She is a senior curator of historic textiles at National Museums Scotland with a responsibility for European and North American dress and textiles from the medieval period to 1850. Helen is a specialist in the history of European tapestry and her book, The Art of Tapestry, was published by Philip Wilson in 2022. She is now focusing on new projects around Scotland's place in the global textile trade. And today she's going to be talking about Edinburgh Shawl's uh, new approaches. So I will stop sharing and hand over to Helen. Um, hi everyone. Thank you so much, Hannah, for the introduction. And thank you to Hannah and Robin for inviting me. Um, I have never been to an at home before and I'm really excited to be here. Um, so this talk um, aims to give a brief overview of an ongoing project at National Museum Scotland to survey our collection of Scottish shawls and to explore new ways of understanding this material in a global context. In this project, I'm exploring how a detailed object-based object approach can contribute to our understanding of the wider cultural meaning of textiles and how textiles as an area of study have the potential to reframe our understanding of colonial dynamics in the early modern and modern period. First, a bit of context on the shawls. The objects that are today generally classed under the blanket term Paisley shawls were produced in Europe from the 1780s onwards, specifically in imitation of hand-woven shawls produced in Kashmir. Kashmir shawls were first found their way to Europe in the 1760s, often having been presented as diplomatic gifts to East India Company officials or other Europeans. In India, these finely woven shawls were worn by most men and women. Long, narrow examples could be worn by men tied around the waist um, as a sash with the decorative ends hanging down. And this is just one example of somebody wearing a cashmere shawl. They were often woven in pairs so that they could be placed back to back, meaning the messy reverse sides were never visible. Once they made their way to Europe, these objects changed in, in meaning. They became sought after female accessories. There are many accounts of male East India Company employees being entreated to bring back shawls as gifts and a commercial import trade was established. True cashmere shawls were high status and very expensive commodities. They're recorded at a cost of some 200 to 300 guineas by 1800. In the imagery of Josephine Bonaparte, some examples cost as much as 12,000 francs. Naturally, this sparked attempts to create cheaper copies domestically. Although the town of Paisley in the west of Scotland became most closely associated with imitation cashmere shawls, production actually began elsewhere, in France, in Paris and Lyon, and in Britain, in Norwich and Edinburgh, where shawls, always described as in imitation of the Indian, were being produced from at least the 1790s. The first shawls were made in Paisley only after 1810, on looms established for silk weaving, and the industry there soon grew rapidly and would flourish until the 1870s. For the NMS project, I decided to focus on Edinburgh shawls for two reasons. First, we have the largest collection in the world of shawls associated with Edinburgh, which have never been the focus of an in-depth study. And second, as these represent the early phase of the fashion for shawls in Europe, um, they have the potential to shed new light on important questions around authenticity and imitation. My aim is to take the Edinburgh shawls as primary evidence, not only for the kind of technical and industrial history, 
that's already been attempted by many scholars looking at shawls, but also for exploring the cultural dy dynamics embedded in the shawl. And in doing this, I'm hoping to bridge the gap between great scholars who specialise in the industry, like um, John Irwin, Valerie Riley, um, and also scholars who are looking more at the cultural meaning of shawls, um, most notably um, Suchitra Chowdhury, whose recent book, Textile Orientalisms, has been a real inspiration in looking at the shawls. The first scholars to look at Edinburgh production were Margaret Swain and Dorothy White, who published an article in 1962 with a wealth of archival material um, showing the premiums given to shawl makers and records of their activity. But at this date, very little was actually known about what the shawls looked like, so it was all guesswork. A breakthrough came in 1973 when a Miss Dunn approached the Royal Scottish Museum via Dorothy White with a group of shawls that she'd inherited for her, from her ancestor, James MacDonald and he was a member of one of the largest Edinburgh firms, Gibbon MacDonald. The objects given by Miss Dunn provided a corpus on which subsequent attributions can be made. And this is just a few of them. Um, they're samples of borders that would have been cut up and sewn onto larger shawls and a sample of a corner motif. And then there are a couple of um, whole shawls as well. Um, based on this corpus of objects, um, further progress was made by Judy Wentworth, a textile dealer who specialises in shawls and other material. Judy was able to identify a number of other shawls which shared characteristics with the Dunn group um, and which were acquired during the 1990s and 2000s by my predecessor, Naomi Tarrant, with the result that we now have around 30 shawls thought to be of Edinburgh manufacture. Judy published an article about these objects um, in the latest Theatre Journal adding various new characteristics which unite these objects. Although a clear corpus of objects has now been collected, questions remain. How can we be sure that these are all made by one manufacturer, given McDonald, rather than a range of different Edwin manufacturers? How do we know that some of these aren't actually early Paisley pieces? The first Paisley shawls were actually woven as a subcontract from an Edinburgh firm. There were very close relationships between the two towns, with weavers traveling between the two and nobody's really pinpointed the character of early Paisley weaving. I wanted to take a scientific approach to try and answer some of these questions. From, oh, here's just another of the examples of this, this Dunn group, um, and one that we acquired from Judy Wentworth. So from January to April this year, I was able to work with two brilliant students from Glasgow University, Violet Colley and Isabel Monceau, and I think at least Isabel is here today, thank you for coming, um, who were doing the Dress and Textiles M Lit course. Um, and they spent 20 days um, with me in the stores looking at the shawls. We attempted to classify all of the so-called Edinburgh shawls in detail, hoping that this could help us establish what was actually going on with this manufacture. This involved a crash course for the students in technical analysis of textiles, I produced a template, which you can't really read, um, to allow everything that we might observe in the shawls to be um, recorded. Um, this involved a lot of headaches, actually, by looking through magnifying glasses to try and count threads. So I apologise to Isabel and Violet for the headaches. Um, recording a number of basic characteristics of these objects. Um, basically, we would measure them, we would record whether they were pieced together or woven in one, whether it was a turnover shawl with part of the border on the opposite way so they could be folded. We would count, do thread counts for warps and wefts, look at the materials of warps and wefts, look at the twist of the thread, whether they're two-ply or single, um, the weave structure, so whether they're all twill, but is it a two-two twill, a three-one twill, and the characteristics of the design, and even things like woven inscriptions. Recording these characteristics should not only allow different manufacturers to be established, it also really highlights the relationship to the cashmere shawls that are being imitated, something that can often be lost sight of in detailed studies of European production. So I'm just going to run through some of the technical elements that really, to me, highlight the efforts being made in Edinburgh to imitate Indian shawls. The first is materials, which are fascinating but hard to distinguish. The documentation shows that prizes were offered in Edinburgh for the use of true cashmere, um, showing that this really was used. And we found some shawls that we were certain were made from cashmere, but it's not always easy to distinguish. Cashmere came from Himalayan mountain goats who only produced this kind of wool but in very cold conditions. And many attempts were made to import these goats to Europe and either the goats died or they didn't produce enough of this very soft, fine underfur because it wasn't cold enough. 
So then efforts were made to import the yarn, but there were many difficulties to that. So this in itself shows the huge lengths being gone to by European producers. They often would instead use a mixture of silk and wool to try and approximate the effects of cashmere, and even in the coloured pattern wefts, a mixture of wool and cotton. So all of these things are telling us a lot about the details of Europeans trying to approximate the effect of something they can't always get hold of. True cashmere shawls are hand woven. This is the other big question, which is technique. So um, a true cashmere shawl is woven in a technique similar to European tapestry, but with a twill binding. And this is part of their expense. The best cashmere shawls would take up to three years to weave. In Europe, manufacturers um, didn't try and attempt this handmade technique. Instead, they, the European shawls are uh, mechanically woven um, with every colored weft thread passing the entire width of the cloth. Um, so whereas in the cashmere shawls, each coloured weft is only used where it's needed in the design. In the European shawls, the coloured wefts go all the way across, and then the hanging threads that aren't used on the front, which are loose on the back, would be shaved off on the back to lighten the technique. And this is another kind of element where the true handmade technique was part of this incredible softness and drape that was so valued in the cashmere shawls, which you couldn't get with mechanical technique. So these are all attempts to try and replicate something um, which just isn't, isn't possible with the mechanical techniques used in Europe. Another thing we noticed was colours. Um, if you're weaving a handmade shawl, any number of colours is possible because each is introduced by hand. But in Europe, um, the number of colours depends on the kind of loom you have. So this can help us distinguish between workshops. This is an example with only three colours, um, but also um, to establish the kind of development of te technological advancements in production. Another thing we noticed um, is that a lot of the Edinburgh shawls have these embroidered marks on them. Um, you do find embroidered marks on Indian shawls, and these often seem to be made for marketing purposes for the use of merchants who were selling them. Um, some European shawls have marks which are imitating these Indian embroidered marks to try and add a sense of authenticity, but the Edinburgh marks seem definitely to have a function. They don't seem aesthetic in purpose. Um, and Isabel and Violet did try and use code breaking techniques to distinguish what these marks might mean um, with kind of inconclusive results, but this is something we're going to follow up. But again, do all these marks mean that these are all made by one manufacturer? Or is this a marketing thing? This is a merchant putting the marks on after they've left the manufacturer. These are all interesting questions. Um, the thing that fascinated me most, I think, is the question of design and how many of the early shawls are really imitating Indian shawls to a degree that before I looked at the Indian material, I really couldn't comprehend. This is actually not a particularly good example, but they're very, very closely copying um, the design of Indian shawls. Um, and we found in the stores a really fascinating group of shawls which don't fit with the main Edinburgh corpus, but they don't fit with any other corpus either. And this is one of them. Um, we looked at all of these again um, last week. Judy Wentworth came to the store and so did Naomi Tarrant, so two of the great shawl experts of the world. And between us, we couldn't really work out what was going on with this early group. The only hypothesis was that this may be the very earliest examples of Edinburgh production that we haven't really got a way of cataloguing yet. They have silk warps mostly, and their designs copy Indian designs extremely closely. So this is a detail of one of them. Um, and it corresponds with what John Irwin has identified in his typology as a kind of mid to late 18th century pattern of the Bhutan motif. Um, and this is an example of a cashmere shawl with a very similar design on it, which we found in the store as well. Um, so these are really inspiring in that they're probably copying actual Indian shawls which had come to Edinburgh. A final um, avenue of research, which I think is also has a huge potential in a museum context is provenance. So that early silk shawl, this one, um, was given to us by a Mrs. Sturrock, and we didn't really know who Mrs. Sturrock was, um, but it turns out she gave us another very important shawl, an Indian shawl, catalogued on our system, as most of the shawls are as Paisley, but it's actually a cashmere shawl. It has not only, um, oh, it has not only um, an embroidered mark, it has an East India Company stamp that you can see at the top right, and then it has the name of the Scottish owner at the other end. So this is real material evidence of an object which has come to Scotland pretty early on with an East India Company stamp. The fact that this 
and three other early British shawls were all in the collection of this one person, suggest some kind of link, um, which I really want to explore more. One thing we have been able to establish is that Mrs. Sturrock was actually, her maiden name was Mary Newbury. She was the daughter of Jesse Newbury, um, the embroiderer, and Jesse Newbury's father was a Paisley weaver. So whether these shawls have come down to Mary Newbury through a route that has to do with the, the industry of shawl making in Scotland, we don't know, but I'm really excited about the potential of that. Um, so finally, um, what comes next? This is obviously, as you can see, a work in progress. Um, I'm going to continue surveying the shawls um, to see what and try and make sense of the conclusions from the technical analysis. Um, I'm hoping to work um, with Suchitra Chowdhury to bring people together for a study day to look at some of the bigger questions that these objects raise to see what can come out of combining this object based approach with the more kind of cultural history approach. Um, and I really want to look at other ways that the detailed object study can shed light on bigger questions of influence, appropriation and colonial dynamics in this period when looking at textiles. Because what I've learned about Edinburgh shawls, to me, it seems to upend the traditional narrative of the Industrial Revolution, which is a narrative of innovation and Western superiority. It's actually a tale of innovation in pursuit of the effects of a superior Indian product whose quality could never actually be matched. Thank you so much, Helen. I'm going to hand over to Robin for Q&A. We've got five minutes for Q&A. Put your questions in the chat and Robin will put them to Helen. Um, thank you so much, Helen. That was fantastic. And what an amazing piece of technical art history research or dress history. I keep wanting to say technical. We need to start saying technical dress history like we do technical art history. Um, and uh, and I did slightly spoil it because you said struck. And I'm like, Mary Neighbor is struck. And I got very, I'm very excited about this. So I want to kind of talk to you more about that, actually. Um, yeah, we've got a few questions. I'll hold off on my own and start in on the ones in the chat first. Hannah has wondered, have many of the shawls in the collection come from industry sources or have they all come from personal donations? And we, we did hear in your talk a bit of a mix there. Um, and Hannah was just wondering how many you've, how, how you ended up with so many of them in the collection. Um, it's a mixture and I haven't done the detailed research on the donors yet. So we have a few from um, people like Dorothy White who were collectors and enthusiasts we have quite a lot of just individual gifts of one or two objects. Um, we have got a large collection of designs as well, and I haven't even had the chance to look at where they came from. So as far as I know, there are no direct industrial gifts apart from this Miss Dunn, who is the descendant of Gibbon MacDonald. Um, we've got about 300 objects described as Paisley or Scottish shawls. It's very funny, they're all described as Paisley, whether they're French, Edinburgh, Russian, you know. Um, and I think they just come to the National Museum of Scotland because we're the National Museum of Scotland. So some have come to the Museum of Antiquities um, as examples of a Scottish tradition. Some have come to the Royal Scottish Museum, which obviously was an industrial museum founded in the 1850s. So that's a very obvious um, kind of reason for collecting those objects. So yeah, that's something that I really want to look into more because the industrial museum was collecting examples of, of manufacturers quite broadly, not just Scottish, but but European and world manufacturers and textile. And so, yeah, that's an interesting further avenue, which I want to go into more. Well, and that kind of leads a bit on to Kate's question, because she was wondering about how you've managed, how much you've managed to catalog so far, what your ultimate ambition for the project is. And I'm going to weave my own question in there, which was actually how many different manufacturers have you um, been able to identify? Because so like, what's the future of all of this, you know, with those bits and pieces? Um, the first step, I think, is a study day. Um, I want to enhance our records so that they're not just all described as, as Paisley. Um, we know there were sort of up to 20 manufacturers in Edinburgh at different points of time. Um, at the moment, I'm not at the point of even being able to disentangle them, but just the session we had last week with Judy and Naomi, looking at lots of them all at once, it was really clear that even if they all had the embroidered marks, they're not all the same. You know they have a, a different different making approaches to them so um that's something that it will take time um we've catalogued about 30 or 40 in detail um but, you know there's a lot more to do and there's a lot that are currently catalogued in very disparate ways so they haven't necessarily even been captured by 
my database searches. So we're actually, me and Emily Taylor, my colleague, we're just unrolling rollers at the moment and finding very surprising stuff. That's how we found this Indian one, which was just described as a paisley shawl. Um, so there's a lot of hidden stuff in there. There's a lot more work to do. And the marks, that is just fascinating. I just want to get in and try to figure this out too, but I, I don't know why I would. Um, and you've mentioned, I see that um, Naomi and Judy is here and Suchitra is here, and she's got a question as well, um, wondering what the role of France is in the evolution of the pine cone design in Britain. Um, that's such an interesting question. Um, I have seen some examples of early French shawls, which are also very closely copying Indian shawls from, you know, the years around 1800. Um, the design starts to change quite rapidly after kind of 1830, and you start to get a lot more complexity. Red starts to take over from the pale end shawls like this one, um, and you have the borders encroaching on the field. And what I don't know is how much that was still Indian design evolving, how much that was European markets changing design, because European markets had an influence on, on Indian design because merchants were now beginning to commission things from Kashmir. Um, but I would say there was a very definite influence of France on British production, especially Paisley. So there were a lot of complaints during the kind of early and middle 19th century of Paisley um, weavers pirating designs from Edinburgh and Norwich. We know that Scottish manufacturers, Edinburgh and Paisley, went to Paris, some of them, one of them, given McDonald's, um, designers went annually to Paris to get designs to bring back. And sometimes they would officially purchase designs, sometimes they would copy them. So I think France, as in many textile arts and other manufacturers, France was seen as a paradigm of good design. And as part of this insecurity of Britain not being, you know, um, advanced enough in design. So I think France was always being looked to, even though there was a design school in Scotland that produced some painted designs. Um, but I think that happens more a bit later. And I haven't I haven't got enough information about the early French production and how that relates. But I think because in the early things, it's more directly copying Indian shawls. That they're fairly similar, but just because they're both copying the same thing. Thank you so much. Um, so opening up so many in, um, avenues. I want to come to that study day when you do it. And um, it, there is a comment which you should look at because uh, from there's apparently more of these shawls at the Ulster Folk Museum. So that's also why we like to do these events because it opens up Amazing. these connections too. And I'm going to just be cheeky for half a second, Hannah, because I'm doing this early because I'm noticing we have so many, like, I think we have a lot of new people who've not been to one of these talks before. And there's lots of folk who are really connected and rich in this community. So I'm going to put a, how to subscribe to our email list in the chat really shortly, um, right. just in case anyone has to leave early. But I wanted you to know, we do these the last Sunday, almost of every month. And it's a huge range of speakers and we want to grow our community. So thank you all to do all the newcomers and we have so many regulars here too. So I'm doing that early instead of at the end, just in case people have to go, but I just thought I'll do that. But back to you, Hannah, and thank you, Helen. That was amazing. Perfect. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Robin. Um, so there is a bit more time at the end for any questions to, that you want to put to Helen that you haven't had a chance to ask her yet. But to stick to time, we'll move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Veronica Main, and she has worked with Straw for over 40 years, producing work for Private Commission, Film and TV. She recently, uh, sorry, recently she retired as a curator for Luton Culture, where she was responsible for the hat industry and headwear collection. She's one of the last straw platters using traditional techniques and has written a book called Swiss Straw Work Techniques of a Fashion Industry to ensure that these skills can be passed on to future generations. And today she's going to be talking to us about straw hats, Luton, then the world. So over to Veronica. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, it's lovely to join you all. I'm Assuming, or I always have the impression that straw hats are somewhat neglected in the dress and costume world um, and the fashion world. They're always seen as a simple accessory and therefore all too commonly, they are just described as being a straw hat. My research encompasses hat, straw hats for men, women and children. 
Uh, but today I want to focus just on hats for women because I think you'll agree, I hope you'll agree, that it's a fascinating story. So I began in the 19, early 1980s um, at Wardown House Museum and Gallery, which has an extensive and world important hat uh, headwear and hat collection. Um, it encompasses a lot of examples from the worldwide hat industry. And it wasn't long until I realized that I was seeing things that didn't quite make sense and I needed to extend my research further. That by the end of the 80s took me off to Switzerland to the newly renamed Schweitzer Straw Museum in Volen to the uh, west of Zurich, which has the most amazing industry archive of muster books, of sample books um, from the industry, of all the materials that were being sold around Europe not only around Europe, into North America and around the world for people to make into hats. And Helen, I'd love to connect with you afterwards with a, with, with a suggestion because there are codes in those muster books and it may be worth something exploring. So being faced with this enormous range of all sorts of different materials, I realized that the current or the definitions that I was working with at that time didn't allow me to make sense of what I was seeing. So with the assistance of the then curator, because I was a humble volunteer, uh, I, we devised a, a definition system to explain our work, better explain our work. So we defined plat, as being a hand produced product. We defined braid as being a machine produced product, not defining the type of machine, but merely that some form of machine was used. And woven, which we then identifying and looking at the pieces of headwear in the collection and the samples and materials, realized we immediately had to break down into loom woven and hand woven, such as you would get with sizal hats today, Buntel hats and Panama hats. So now we had a, a sort of a definition system that we could start to divide out and, and start to catalogue and understand the hats and the products that we were seeing. Next came the big problem of materials. Straw hats. I naively went into this thinking that every hat I was going to look at was going to be made from straw. Cereal crop straw is a tiny proportion of the straw materials that were used in the hat industry. And so again, we had to redefine what we meant when we were talking about straw. And so straw produces a, high, a, a lightweight hat. It can be a natural fiber, which is native to the area in which the platys and the hats are being made, or it can be later in the 19th century, a man-made fibre, and the hat industry were very quick to em embrace man-made fibres. Remember, the hat industry is all about fashion, and one thing I must break off and say at this stage, we are so misled about hats in the 19th century because the images are black and white. Very often the fashion plates don't emphasize the hats themselves, they will emphasize the color of the trimmings on the hats. But you can see from the side of, of this image, the range of patterns of colorways. And again, as soon as chemical dyes came on the scene in the 1800s, the hat industry were one of the first to embrace them to produce the most outrageous colors of plaits and, and braids and materials that they would weave. So colour was always vitally important in the industry. One of the most important materials in the hat industry is wood chip. And that goes from 
in the moment I can date it back to the early, uh, sorry, the late 1400s, but it carried on into the industry as a really dominant material into the 1950s and really was all the rage in the 19th century. Why? Because it was very lightweight, it was easy to make up, it was cheap material, it didn't take too much preparation, it could be worked into a number of ways, but straw, cereal crop straw, or palm leaves could, could never be made white. And the surface of most of those materials meant that any color you applied to the surface other than dyes uh, really couldn't color them white. Chip could be painted white, which in the mid 19th century, when white wedding bonnets came fashionable, was the godsend to the industry. So chip was a really important material. I could spend easily half an hour simply talking about Leghorn. And one of the hats that is most synonymous with the 19th century is the Leghorn bonnet. Can I plead with you, please dismiss from your mind that Leghorn indicates the, the point of production of a, a bonnet? No, it doesn't. They were not made in Leghorn or Livorno. They were made in other parts of Italy, principally in villages around Florence, but other areas of Italy as well. When you refer to Leghorn, it's really important to realize that within the trade, Leghorn could mean a bonnet. It could mean part of a bonnet. They a bonnet was made up of different sections and so a, a, there could be a cornetto, there could be a flat, both are called leghorns. It could refer to the straw, it could refer to the method of stitching the straw together. So within the industry you have to be very careful when you define a leghorn bonnet as to what you're talking about but definitely not made in Livorno. The top image shows you the fineness of the straw they were working with very often they were working with grasses and below the method of stitching together edge to edge, edge to edge ramae um, which gave this smooth much coveted finish to the to the bonnet a lot of italian straw was imported from the 1700s and extensively through the early part of the 1900s into great britain other parts of europe and north america for the platters to actually work with why because every wanted one wanted fine lightweight straw hats and they wanted to emulate the 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 famous italian Florentine bonnet that was coming over. So many hats described as Tuscan in museum collections actually doesn't indicate that they were made in Tuscany necessarily, although they may have been, but probably does indicate that they're made with Tuscan straw. And there are ways you can start to investigate this, but too detailed for this talk. The method of construction on a Tuscan bonnet is by overlapping, which was the, the standard way that most bonnets were actually constructed. So overlapping rather than edge to edge. Another astounding material that came in at the beginning of the 1800s may date back to the 1700s. I'm still doing some research on this. A straw fabrics where straw is split Again, splitting straw, I could go into a half hour diatribe on that. I won't, don't worry. Um, but straw is used as the weft, silk is used as the warp. And of course, as soon as Jacquard introduced his loom attachment, the hat industry embraced it. These wonderful flexible straw fabrics, because they knew how to prepare the straw so it was flexible and durable, were cut as pattern pieces and then made up into fabulous, marvellous bonnets in, in, the, uh, in the 19th century. But the industry knew no bounds. This is all about fashion. This is all about innovation. This is all about bringing in new materials as quickly as you can. So bourgeois, the loom woven braids of so many patterns, so many different materials, 
horse hair was vitally important, so much so that for a short period in the middle of the 1800s, the industry became as the, known as the straw and horsehair industry, such as the dominance of horsehair, worked on machines, worked by hands. And it went on. They had to keep innovating. They had to keep developing new ideas. And I'm saying they, who are they? Italy, France, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, UK. And all these centers of industry were all competing against each other to keep at the top of their game and keep hats really fashionable. It wasn't surprising that I've, I've said that uh, the introduction of chemical dyes revolutionized the hat industry. It, and so it wasn't surprising that with the introduction in the 1890s of the first cellulose fibers, which could be produced as endless fibers, and therefore suitable for working on machines, that again, the hat industry absolutely embraced it. And the number of products and the diversity of using these materials went right through into the middle of the uh, 20th century. It was all about innovation and creating new products for the hat industry. I meant to mention to Hannah, and I think it's partly because I've, I'm sort of still in a state of shock that it's happened, but I have, oh dear, what happened there? Um, I have written a book, uh, which comes out on the 17th of August, Straw Plaiting, Heritage Techniques for Hats, Trimmings, Bags and Baskets. It will tell part of the story of the hat industry from the perspective of straw plaiting. It shows how this was a global industry, how all the centers interacted with each other and exchanged and sometimes stole ideas, very much like in the shawl, making of shawls. It's all about fashion, it's all about copying. There is a wonderful hat exhibition on at the moment at uh, Luton at Stockwood Discovery Centre, Hats Made Me, which if you're in the vicinity, you may find interesting. I could go on for hours. I promise I'm stopping now. Thank you so much. Amazing. There are so many comments in the chat about how incredible these examples are uh, and lots of questions as well, I think. So I will pass straight over to Robin. Thank you very much, Veronica. Yes, please do put your questions in the chat. Those are just spectacular uh, examples and and oh. whoo. Um and and yay, thank you for putting your book in. Um I think we're all going to be wanting to get that and I mean the one thing I've learned here is a straw hat is mostly not straw, which is fascinating. <laughs> like it's and and I, and I am like, yeah, why don't we spend more time on straw? It's just they it's almost is it because they're ubiquitous or we just take them for granted or I think we take them for granted. And when I was doing my research, the problem was I did not have um, a Bible to go to. You think of all the other aspects. Helen was explaining, yes, yeah, she's got these other publications that she could refer to and then take the research further. There really is very little. And even Anne Buck, who grew up at Luton with the hat industry, um, she she didn't wasn't sufficiently interested. So in Anne book, Buck's book, she really doesn't describe, and she knew a lot more than she she uses and, and says in her book. So I think it needs the publications there for people to use as the stepping stone to then challenge and develop new arguments. You are doing amazing work. We need them. Thank you so much. Um, so some of the questions that are coming in, Suchitra is wondering, uh, love the story like we all did. Was there any evolution or change in the style of straw hat in which social class typically assumed them? Um, straw hats with the innovation of materials became less expensive. So you had uh, working classes suddenly wearing more fashionable hats because they were more accessible to them. Again, this is a potential area of real significant research to really start looking at this. And as with so many museum collections, only the finest examples exist rather than the working class 
um, examples. But yes, I am picking up indications. Um, there are accounts where there's great annoyance that the working girls can't be told apart from the rich girls because of their fashion and hat styles. So there are indications. So future research. Um, and it sounds like any potential uh, students out there, there's a PhD kicking around here. Oh, to yes. Pick up. Um, and Hannah's wondering if they were always professionally produced or did women ever plate their own straw bonnets at home? Oh, yeah. At the beginning of the 19th century, it really was very much a home industry. And it was really with evolution in the industry and mechanization and industrial mechanization and better trade as well. There'd always been trade, but better trade that uh, it went more over to a factory side of it. And uh, the home industry really started to die out and it became a millinery trade rather than a hat making trade at home. Although having said that, there are still in the hat making areas, women working from home. So it's still piece homework in some areas. Um, Karina's asked a question, which I was kind of wondering about too, when you said it, um, by artificial, what was the material that they were using to create that mimic straw? Oh, well, cellulose fibers developing into viscous fibers and they worked out how they extruded them could could change them significantly and they could color them as well and of course they're producing them on braiding machines and they can create different pattern ways and and widths and designs in the braiding machines and they don't need these pesky workers anymore they can just make these long cheap lengths so it's really at the end of the 19th century that hats dramatically dramatically get a lot less expensive but also the lightweight cheap materials allow the evolution of style into the much bigger Edwardian hats which if you were using the materials from the beginning of the 19th century would be far too heavy you'd be absolutely weighted down and neck ache wearing them so um, it, it's all this evolution the whole evolution affects style affects shape affects everything that's really interesting I have like about five questions just on the back of that but let me just double <laughs> check here um uh you did speak a little bit about the hats that are in collections are obviously the the you know finer things but um Suzanne was wondering if they generally survive well in museum collections or is there a proliferation of these um very often because they're not considered as valuable as some other objects in some museums, they really could do with better storage conditions uh, from my, are my observations. Um, where you run into problems and where again with surviving examples we are misled is that the early chemical dyes corroded the natural cereal crop straw and broke it down. And therefore, as soon as you get a hat that's breaking down, it's deaccessioned. And my fear is we're going to find this into the 20th century with hat collections that were made with the early cellophanes. And they're already starting to break down. And we're going to lose that knowledge of 20th century hats as well. That actually reads my mind of one of the questions I just had, which was about the survival of it, the cellulose ones versus obviously ones that were natural material. As long as they're only bleached um, and later on with the dyes, they seem to survive. Black dye was particularly noxious to, to straw hats uh, because of the mordants that they used in there. And that really did destroy the straw pretty quickly. And it's heartbreaking to see. And of course, pests on the horsehair. So I know from the statistics and the information how large the horsehair industry is. You try finding a horsehair bonnet in a museum collection, and it's really difficult to find because they were eaten away by tiny microscopic mites and lost and deaccessioned. Wow. This wow. is why it's so important to, to get this while we've still got the materials, because that's our evidence for the hats that were made and explanation of the fashion plates. 
That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. I have one tiny little question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up, which is, I was absolutely fascinated about the wood chip. Um, it made me wonder like, was, did this develop as a byproduct? Like I was thinking a bit about baleen, like it's, you know, it's a byproduct that then gets starts used. Is this like cast off wood chip? Oh, let's make this into hats. And do they use stain on it? Right. You said painted, but like, yeah. Yep. No, they stained it. Um, the Arnofini painting, He's wearing a plat hat, a hat made of straw plat, and it probably is wood chip. And it because of the connections of him and Italy and Flanders, and also there's another famous p- painting by Pisanello, it's a wood chip hat. Mm-hmm. So it's the lightweight, it's the cheapness, and it's quite easy to produce. I'm so excited because I love teaching Arnolfini and that's one more material culture thing to add to my long list of things that I use that painting to teach. State beds and and fabric, you know, ermine, all the bits. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's fascinating. Back to you, Hannah. There will be a little bit more time at the end for any questions for Veronica that you didn't manage to get in uh, this time. But for now, we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, So our next speaker is Nicole Rudolph. She is a full-time fashion history content creator on YouTube, where she focuses on bringing her expertise in historic shoemaking, sewing, and tailoring to a broad international audience. She has an MFA in material culture from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And before her career on YouTube took off, she worked for several years at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and as the artistic director and designer of American Duchess Shoes. And today she is completing our outfit and she's talking about elastic shoes stretching back almost 200 years. So thank you, Nicole. Thank you. All right, let's get that up. So um, I have been grabbing gradually collecting uh, antique shoes for the last few years. And I think I'm up to about 50 pairs at this point in time. And I've started to notice more and more how early of an adoption that they have for technology, just the same as everything else we've been talking about today. Fashion just loves to take anything new. And so it seems to be the case with elastic as well, which though we think of elastic shoes as pretty modern, they are surprisingly not. So early elastic, prior to them figuring out what we usually term elastic with you know, rubber and that sort of thing, were little tiny springs. And there aren't a ton of examples that survive. This is one of the few that you can still find. And Once we reach the 1830s, they're starting to figure out how to actually take rubber, the plant, and turn it into something that's longer lasting. Because prior to that, most of its usage was local to where it was being grown, simply because it was an organic material and it would deteriorate and not last very long. So once we reach the 1830s, they're starting to figure out that process. And though 1844 is the official year that vulcanization occurs in terms of an invention, there are patents dating back to the 1830s as they're figuring out mixing sulfur and heat and different things like that with rubber will end up giving you a consistent material that doesn't break down as quickly. Obviously, it still breaks down. We've all pulled plenty of things out of our closet with elastic in them even just 20 years ago, and it's completely deteriorated. But that was something that they were throwing into fashion very early. One of the earliest uses of it were Macintosh coats, where they would paint the substance between the layers of fabric to make it waterproof. Stretch was still kind of the thing they were figuring out. When we go and look at the shoes of the 1830s and 40s, side lacing boots were a really popular item. Um, These are both in my collection. And obviously they are comfortable, but inconvenient to lace up and unlace every single day. It's not always the easiest thing. So some of the earliest inventions actually were side elastic boots. And this particular patent is from 1840. So even before the official vulcanization uh, occurs as they were starting to put patents in, and this is actually from DuPont and Hyatt, names that are exactly what you think of. Um, And they were putting elasticated panels in the sides of boots. Interestingly enough, in this patent, they say they are not the first to do this. They are not the only people who are making elastic panels. They are not the only people who are putting elastic panels in boots. They are just trying to patent the process that they specifically came up with for making 
making those panels and inserting them and how they did that whole thing. So it's a very specific process already by this point. And they talk about how they take little, essentially long strands of rubber that are in a square shape, and they take panels of fabric to the finished size that they need, and they will run stitches all the way down, put little brass tubes through it, insert the rubber that way, pull the fabric out and then sort of shear it up over it, then tamp down the sides um, using a little bit more of that essentially rubber cement as we think of it today to hold the ends together before they stitch it in. They also talk about a secondary option where instead of stitches, they essentially glue the whole piece together. And this was something that I found particularly interesting because recently I acquired a pair of boots, which I had been dating to possibly the late 1840s simply because of the elastic. But having gone back and looked at earlier patents and things like that, I do think these might be more early 1840s because they have exactly the sort of process that they are talking about in that early uh, 1840 patent where the elastic on the side of these boots is simply glued together. Um, there's not lines of stitching, as you can see. There's um, specifically a fabric that is almost exactly the same as the exterior fabric, which is also in the patent. They say preferably you use a matching or coordinating fabric for the exterior. And then for the interior, they use a lightweight muslin, something that you know won't cause a lot of bulk. And then they glue it together and you can see the little channels there where everything was at one point gathered up. And most interestingly, I had noticed when I first started looking at these that the edges are completely raw. So they're not a folded and finished top edge. They are cut. And if you tug on it just slightly, it does start to deteriorate really fast because not surprisingly, if all of the elastic and the rubber inside is completely deteriorated, the glue is essentially as well. So these layers would have just been held together uh, essentially by rubber cement. And uh, so I'm thinking more, I'm looking at this, that this might actually be an example of a really early 1840s style because they're talking pretty early about um, these Congress boots, about these different styles, which early on, they weren't actually called Congress boots. This article is from 1847, so they were using that term by that point. But they're talking about how um, you go back to 1839, and they invented and applied the elastic gores as a substitute essentially for the laces on the side. And though it had been, according to them, very valuable, it has generally not been used, um, mainly from the fact that the elastic material used was too expensive and unsuited to the peculiar and required. And if you read into this more and start looking for other articles, uh, what I was finding was the fact that temperature is still a huge problem. They had not yet figured out vulcanization perfectly, which meant that rubber was still susceptible to heat. So though apparently in 1840, they were quite popular in April, by the time they reached July, everyone's shoes were melting. <laughs> So it then became a bit of a less popular thing very quickly when everyone's shoes turned into a sticky glob for the summer. So they originally, therefore, were putting, a, you know, wrapping elastic with all sorts of different threads and fabrics, trying to keep them from melting and coming apart. One of the earlier people that sometimes in historical record claims to have invented this shoe overall, but there's not really, his patents are coming out at the same time, if not after that 1840 patent, um, was uh, J. Sparks Hall, who also wrote a book about shoes um, much later uh, called The Book of the Feet from 1847. And in this, he's talking about his invention and the popularity of the style of boot that he was making, very similar to the one uh, that I just showed. And he calls them lazy boots <laughs> down at the bottom, which I thought was wonderful, because that's kind of the point. It meant that you can put your shoes on without having to lace or button them, particularly great for children or people that can't manage to uh, do that sort of dexterity. And there are plenty of articles that talk about that patent that he had as well. Um, this is one of his advertisements. As of 1842, he was advertising all over uh, different British newspapers, uh, and he starts also quoting the fact that, like, the Queen is a big fan of his shoes, and so he's making shoes for the Queen, and it's a really big deal. So that's one of the reasons why his name is highly associated with this early style of boots, even before they are called Congress boots, because he's still just referring to them as elastic-sided boots, um, that sort of thing. So we don't have that term just yet. 
but elastic is also being used in other places pretty early on. This is another single shoe that I recently acquired, um, and it's got two other shoes with it. It's a whole big mystery unto itself, but it has an elastic strap that would have been wrapped around the ankle to help hold things on for dancing, because that is one of the things that they also talk about with both the boot style and other shoes, that elastic became the really popular popular option uh, for women to do dancing in just because it held onto their foot more comfortably and flexed with them as they needed to. This particular elastic is exactly like we would find today, aside from the fact that it is wrapped in silk rather than, you know, modern polyester, but it is nearly identical in terms of the braiding techniques that we're still seeing when you go out and get a little strip of elastic today. But a lot of things started to change pretty rapidly as of that 18, late 1840s point. Not only did the Congress boot, as it became called as of 1847, really take off, it made its way over to America around that point. And they're saying it was so popular, they were having trouble actually keeping it on the shelves. So even, even as of 1848, it was selling out very rapidly. Once we reach 1851, a major event occurs, which is sort of the first World's Fair, or more specifically, um, the Great Exhibition of Works of Industry of All Nations, which happened in London and is the famous Crystal Palace. And they had so many amazing different inventions and concepts there. One of the big ones was rubber. And in fact, Goodyear, uh, another big name in everything, had what he called his vulcanite court, uh, which is another term for a hardened version of vulcanized rubber. And he had an entire house and life built around everything being rubber. So it really took off as of that point. And we're also fortunate enough that there are a lot of surviving examples from shoes that were being uh, exhibited there because shoemakers and all sorts of other technology and artisans and tradespeople, they all showed off what they had and what they could make. And so there are a lot of examples from 1851 at the V&A in particular, because a lot of that stuff was just donated directly to them, uh, of shoes with elastic sides or other elastic panels in them. So this is a, a great example of one with a silk-based elastic on the side, which is very similar to another pair in my collection, uh, which is from 1867. I can date this pretty particularly because it is also from a World's Fair, uh, not the 1851 World's Fair, um, but there's actually a little stamp on the bottom that says Exposition Universelle, which um, this pair was made by Fortier, and the symbol that's pretty faded at this point is from the 1867 one rather than the 1855 one. There's two different ones under that name, uh, but these are styled appropriate for 1867 as well. So the Congress boot elastic sided style was still very much around by that point. Um, unlike the first one that used two panels of fabric, this one is using a silk woven between layers. So it's very much the same sort of weaving pattern that we come to expect with our modern things. They're finding that obviously if you leave some gaps, it makes it a lot easier for it to actually constrict and um, come down because the way that these are being woven is they take the little strips of rubber, they stretch them out and they cool them, and then they solidify there. They're no longer stretchable. They're no longer elastic when they're in their cooled and stretched state. And then they can weave the whole fabric around them, at which point they add the heat back in and the whole thing constricts back up and becomes elastic again. And especially early on, they were calling this uh, rubber springs instead of elastic. So elastic was just the term that stuck, uh, even though originally it was just used to describe the type of activity <laughs> that it did. Um, and I really love the fact that because it is such a lightweight, sheer fabric, you can really see where it, the elastic has split into all sorts of tiny little bits um, and fragments. And it's interesting because in its natural state, the particular tree that they are using for this type rather than um, the gutta percha tree, the India rubber tree, actually has a milky white substance, but they often dyed it black or brown. It was one of the only things they could dye it early on simply because of the heat process. Eventually they started using chemicals and could manage to insert dyes instead. But it, I found it interesting that they still used black in this otherwise completely ivory shoe rather than going 
something with the natural tone, but I'm sure that was probably was more available at the time, perhaps. I have yet to see the, the milky white that we still associate today with like elastic threads. I don't see that very often in the antiques that I've looked at. Um, so I'm still keeping an eye out for that. But there are tons of other examples. They tend to use the color of the fabric being woven more so than trying to color the elastic itself. This pair is knit with elastic at the top. They have a men's shoe with elastic over the top of the foot, so they're they're inserting it really wherever they can start to figure out. Um, and the style continues. The term Congress boot likely comes from this popularity in the uh, United States when it made its way over here in 1847, and at that point they started making their way through the Congress in America and the popularity gave its name. That is the story. I still have not been able to find that exact um, information from the time period. I've also seen some claims that Chelsea boot was an early thing, but I have everything I've found is just bootmakers in Chelsea seeming to be the um, quotes for that. So I don't think that was the term until the 1960s um, when the popularity of that style came back in. Uh, but this pair is from the 1890s and it's called a Juliet boot. So it's a slightly different style than the earlier Congress version with the, the lower top and those curves on top. Uh, but it has a very similar type of elastic panels on the side. It's interesting, though, that this one is a much heavier fabric. I'm pretty sure it's a cotton based off of the texture of it. It's a very heavy weight elastic, though, and it's the only one out of the um, four that I have that still has any stretch left in it, though not much. And interestingly enough, the interior of the elastic is woven with ivory and brown threads, and the exterior is done in black, which is pretty common in shoemaking as a general practice, um, not only for elastic like this, but any ribbon trim or things like that starting in like the 18th century you'll find a lot of black ribbon trims are woven half and half so that way the inside always stays ivory so it doesn't rub off on your stockings so I found it interesting that they took that um, practice from earlier shoe styles with the binding and even incorporated it into uh, early versions of elastic like this but all this is simply to say that elastic is surprisingly present in early shoes, um, even beyond what I was first expecting. And it was one of the earliest adoptions, even before they had really figured out how to work with elastic properly in order to adapt it and uh, make it a huge part of fashion. So I just found it interesting that uh, the some of the earliest patents specifically had to do with elastic and shoes. Thank you. Anna, are you in? Sorry, I was so busy writing a question in the chat that I was, I was distracted. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> thank you so much, Nicole. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so if people want to put their questions in the chat, then Robin, if you spend about five minutes on questions for Nicole, um, and then we've got a little bit of time as well where we can open it up to some other questions for all three of our speakers, any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask earlier. So just load your questions in the chat and we'll let Robin work her way through them. Thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you. I mean, another absolutely fantastic. I, I think all of the talks today have just had such a rich technical scientific study to them that I am loving. Um, there's so many. Um, I'm going to just dive in right in on this one because the comfort thing jumped out at me. The one thing I, you know, in my imaginings that someday I am going to join you on the reenactor trail on a cruise ship someday. Um, but what shoe will I wear? Cause I'm a Birkenstock girl. <laughs> and I'm like, but these look comfortable, especially the first ones, the flat, like, can you talk? Mm -hmm. And I noticed in the quote, it said, these boots, these boots are the comfort of my life. Is there a lot of discourse around comfort with these? Yes, um, I actually my entire thesis from grad school was talking about um, the concern over unhealthy and uncomfortable shoes <laughs> in the 19th century. Oh, I need to read that. <laughs> um, yeah, because it's, it, it was a huge question for them um, at that time, whether too tight, so elastic answered that problem because it kept things snug to your foot, but allowed you to flex and move. Um, if things weren't breathable enough, some of the things that they early uh, attempted with rubber was to coat shoes in it to make them waterproof, which also keeps water inside. 
<laughs> so they're like, that's not really a good thing. Never mind on that feet sweat too much as we discovered. Um, and they were concerned. They were trying to figure out if heels are going to be more comfortable or less comfortable. And we're talking about like half inch, one inch heels, not what we consider high heels. Um, so that was a, a huge concern for them. Um, and so it's not just like the early 20th century shoes that are comfort, like plastered everywhere. Uh, it, it is throughout the 19th century as well. Fantastic. Yeah, and we need to chat. Um, <laughs> Hannah's wondering uh, how the rubber felt in the early examples and how, how much it's hardened. I think you talked a little bit about that. Oh yeah, it's just little pebbles at this point. <laughs> there is there is nothing remotely elastic um, about it at this time. It is shattered into a bunch of little pieces, and in some cases, like the the early 1840s pair, um, what comes out of that little open edge is just crumbles and dust. So it is not honestly perceptible as elastic, aside from the fact that it clearly like was at some point. Marie's asks, "Are these all straight?" Um, most of the ones that I have are, um, right left, um, simply because I've got these right here. Um, they're already starting that as of the, I'm not sure if we're able to do this or not, the, uh, 1840s. So that's one of the interesting things. You can actually see some design work on, um, that, but as of the 1840s, much with that comfort discussion, they're already like, maybe we should go back to right and left. That might be more healthy and comfortable. Um, though the really lightweight shoes, honestly, I've, made and worn all of these styles regularly um and they quickly become right and left uh you don't get a choice on that so that's why all of the antiques everything you look at in museums if you see a footprint on the bottom it is very consistent once they pick right and left they stick with it um the the other 1840s example i have actually has like a little stamp that says gauche um left in it so <laughs> even though that one is straight last it's already starting to tell people like stick to one side so we've got, that's really interesting. I didn't think about that. Um, here's a combo question from Hannah and Kate's coming in. So Hannah wondered, um, how did you start your collection? Do you go out with the intention of collecting elastic shoes? I think you have a lot more than that. And where have you sourced them from? And Kate said, it must be hard to keep on top of storage with so many complex materials. And how do you do that as a collector? So as a collector, how? Yeah, um, what what happened was I started making, I learned how to make um, 18th century style women's shoes when I was still working at Williamsburg, and it just kind of kept growing from there as I was taking lessons and venturing into other time periods, and it just kind of reached a point where I was not, where I I live currently in Nevada is not really near a lot of museums. I can't just pop over to a place a couple hours away to go look at a bunch of antiques. That is a like six to eight hour um, plane trip to get just about anywhere. And that meant that in order to look at these up close, I really needed to have a collection. And I had a lot of connections to people that were already buying antiques and places to buy them from. So I am just constantly on Etsy, eBay, and I follow a lot of antique dealers on Instagram. <laughs> and they know me and they let me know, hey, I've got shoes pretty early. Um, so that's how I've ended up with most of what I've got. It's really only been the last like two and a half years um, that I started truly collecting. I have my first pair was from about 10, 15 years ago, um, but I haven't really done much since then. Um, up until recently. And I actually, fortunately for living in Nevada, um, the weather here is very neutral. We It's very dry. Um, it's right at a good level of humidity for storing antiques. We also have almost no bugs in terms of things that are potentially problematic. So I don't have to store them away in boxes in the same way. I just keep them in the guest bedroom, which is super dark. And I actually have um, a very large um, antique used to store music, sheet music. So every single box is the about the exact same size for a shoe box of, of shoes. Um, so I keep them currently stored on um, little uh, shell, little cardboard um, and you know, acid-free cardboard things in each of these little shelves around. Um, so fortunately for me, I have an easy time here, but if I move, that might be a different story. <laughs> I don't look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, and the moving will be fun. Um, there's a couple more questions here, but I also say if you've got questions for anyone who spoke today, please feel free to add them to the chat and we can um, see if we can get to those too. Um, Z is wondering, do you see shoes with no heel at all, like a modern zero drop? I mean, that early, the first one you were showing, yeah. that's the one that I quite liked. I'm like, oh, there's a heel I could tolerate. 
Yeah, um, heels drop off from being popular starting in the very beginning of the 19th century. There are still some heels in the 1800s, but not very many. Um, so it pretty much goes flat from then up till 1851, the same event that we talked about. They introduced what they called high heels, which is anything over an inch and a half. Um, that's how they defined high heels. So we're we're talking, a, you know, that that inch and a half, like it's not hugely high heel. That is a very high heel for them. Um, and so that's when that comes back in, but for that roughly 50 year period, um, honestly, longer than that, it's almost entirely flat shoes with no heel aside from men's shoes have usually a little stacked heel during that time, but women's don't have any. Karina's asked a really good research question. I like these kinds. Um, I've been doing my own research on elastic and ran into the issue that finding information on the early use of elastic is difficult because of the terminology to use for the search engines. Are there terms they use that you would suggest? I know you mentioned rubber springs. Yeah, they still use the term springs, um, India rubber. Um, and I don't know how to pronounce the... The, the terminology that they use, Kachuk, or whatever it is, um, is the more scientific term, and they use that early on pretty often. Um, gutta percha is another one that gets used a lot, though it is not the elastic version. It's the hardened, darker color version that comes from Asia. Um, so that will also get you a lot of things at the same time. There's a um, shoe book, um, the 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 18... 1858 um the book of shoe manufacturing um it's not the exact title something like that um but from 1858 it's almost entirely about <laughs> like 90 percent of the book is just talking about rubber in shoes uh, because they also used it as a glue so the the gutta percha um in its early usage was a rubber cement and they stopped sewing shoes or, or using little wooden pegs to put shoes together and started gluing shoes together as of the 1830s so even our modern day versions of shoes are still made the same way. And um, oh, good. One more question uh, here. Did the development of elastics also have an impact on the straw hat making, either in decoration or in the hats themselves? A bit of a crossover there. Hmm, interesting one. Not really, um, because uh, the. Now that that is a really good thought provoking question, um, not in the actual design or the materials used because the methods of constructions had their own elasticity to them. So it wasn't necessary to add in a material that had its own elasticity. Um, it came in in the 20th century with headbands on the inside uh, to, to ensure a better fit. Uh, into men's hats, but not so much into women's hats. But the lining of hats is a whole different subject. <laughs> I could go on about that forever. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much to all of you for fascinating things. And I know we've got two books coming out. One, because Nicole, you're going to have one coming as well. <laughs> yeah. That'll, yeah. that'll be next year. <laughs> okay, great. We'll, we'll be happy to promote that and a study day. So I love that there's actually research forthcoming that we can all dive into. So, um, but thank you so much, Hannah, I'll hand it back over to you to close out. Perfect. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, I'm just going to share the closing slide for everyone, because as Robin said, there's a few new people on the session today. Uh, so just to start with saying thank you so much to our three speakers today, Helen Well, Veronica Main, and Nicole Rudolph. Uh, the talks today were really impressive in their level of technical expertise. I was uh, very, very impressed. It's really, really interesting. Uh, I learned so much, so thank you so much. Thanks to Robin for being question master, master and Kate uh, for doing Twitter today. Uh, remember to follow us on our social media channels. Uh, have a look on our website. Uh, we record these sessions. We try our best to get them up on YouTube. Um, so lots of them are up there if you ever miss them. Uh, and as Robin put in the chat, make sure to sign up to our mailing list and you'll hear all about the, the future sessions that we have coming up. 
The next one that we have is at the end of July. And for that one, we are focusing on student research. So we're going to hear from um, some of the new generation of dress and textile historians, uh, listen to the 19th century research that they are conducting at the moment. So I think that's going to be a really exciting session. Um, so nothing left for me to say other than thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and that I hope you all have a brilliant rest of the day and we look forward to seeing you in July. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Oh my gosh, that was so fantastic. I'm, my head is full <laughs> in a really good way. Yes, exactly. It was fascinating. Um, Nicole, am I allowed to uh, ju I'll just ask you a, a question? Mm -hmm. um, I have been doing some work into waterproofing. Um, and so I'd be really interested to hear what kind of um, sources you've been kind of like your go to sources for looking at the rubber uh, work, because I'm guessing that there's a fair bit of crossover. Uh, in oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um... A lot of a lot of what I uh, was referencing today was stuff that I did when I was in, in graduate school, um, when I was trying to look up shoes, and I just kept coming across all of all of the discussion over um, health and shoes and sweat and all of that. Yeah. Um, so that was where most of uh, like this started from. Was I kept finding that issue like of like commentary. really rubberized mm -hmm. shoes like that early? Yeah. Um, and went forward with that. That. Um, so I haven't dug into that as much beyond mm. the uh, Macintosh coat being okay. like the the early thing that they just keep bringing up over and over and mm. over again. Um, which obviously there's plenty of um, you know that still exists. So there's some things kept somewhere. <laughs> yes, that. exactly. Yeah, exactly. There must be. I mean, for me, it's really hard because I'm um, I have this this idea that quite a lot of the early examples will just be not in collections because they will have deteriorated to such oh. extent that there's no point even yeah them, so yeah like I said there's there's I it definitely would be um interesting in seeing what the VNA has because like mm. I said so much stuff was donated just after that 1851 yeah. um the um original dates on a lot of them were 1860 and then they like re did some things and they've got newer um years on them in terms of mm -hmm. when they were taken in but they all are still labeled as 1851 and mm -hmm. so I have a feeling they've at some point probably had more in their collection um yeah. may have been deaccessioned like late 19th century if it disintegrated yeah. but <laughs> they might have some more things with that yeah, um also the records mightn't they if they had yeah had there's also um a good amount that made its way down to Australia um oh, issue okay stuff. so the um and I've completely forgotten the name of the museum down there, but the big industrial museum that they have okay. oh, um, look at them. down there, they, they, there was a shoemaker who uh, was collecting antique shoes when he lived in England and he mm. took his entire like hundreds of shoes oh, and, wow. and other uh, related things down there um, to the powerhouse museum. Um, something oh, yeah, like, yeah, actually, rings a bell. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they might have some weird things too um, that made their way down there. But that's that's where most of the stuff that I found specific to the that weird 1850s era comes from. Yeah. Okay. No, that's really interesting. Thank you. That's really, really interesting. Yeah, Hannah, whilst I whilst I think about it, I've just I've just found an account of some um it was I was doing some more mountaineering stuff and it was women mountaineer, it was um the Fox Talbot family mm. who were um from Bristol and um they talk about a Macintosh sleeping bag that they had made. Oh, cool. In collaboration with a Bristol manufacturer and a, a, her brother okay. kind of collaborated with the design on it. So I'll, I'll dig that out. And oh, send that'd be amazing. Thank on you. Internet Archive, so I'll let yeah, you know. that'd be fab. Yeah, the, uh, the Vulcanite court that Goodyear had um, literally was an entire house made of it's kind of like we think of plastic in like the 1950s house of the future everything's plastic they did the same thing with rubber where every single item in the house was made out of it it sounds so horrifying <laughs> and very sweaty and sticky yeah <laughs> <laughs> not, not a good idea yeah um i'm <laughs> just i'm gonna say this out loud just because I, I feel badly um apparently we've got in my uh glasgow zoom there's a q a box which i totally missed and someone has used it as they properly should have oh do you only see them on the webinar so i don't know if this is a new feature that they've added so 
Anne Bradbird asked, um, what would Prunella shoes have any stretch to them mentioned in an old family letter? I don't have the date at hand, but 1820s. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Prunella um, and Kalamanko were two of the really popular wools for shoes um, as of the 18th century. They really took off. I haven't dug back further than that. Um, but uh, the the example that I showed the um, 1840s is out of that same sort of wool um, in that like it's just meant to be a hard wearing somewhat satin finish. Um, that one probably is Prunella because it's not Kalamanko. It's not glazed. Um, but yeah, it's just a hard wearing really um, popular wool for shoes. So they definitely could have done them with elasticated panels, but, and there's definitely stretch to it. Having like reproduced these, they are very moldable just because they're fabric um, or lightweight leathers, but they don't inherently have like a lot of stretch to them. Mm. Okay, thank you. Gosh, I feel bad. We all have to look for that in the future that- Oh, that there's a separate Q and A. Yeah, that's and then not chat. yeah, that's confusing, in, isn't it? That's a webinar thing. That's not usually in a regular Zoom. It must be a new <laughs> thing to look out for. And I feel badly, but anyway, I'm glad we got that in. Ending. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, I think my partner's putting the barbecue on, so I think I better go and be social and uh, enjoy the rest of my afternoon. Thank you. I know. So I'm going to say goodbye. Yes, um, it was really lovely to, to meet all of uh, Nicole and Helen and Veronica. I don't know if these people are still here. Uh, it was really, it was a really good session. So thank you so much. Excellent session. We'll let you know when we get the video up and send it around to you guys too. And please yeah. come to our events in future and get involved with us. It's a nice little network of all kinds. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Right. See, see you all soon. Lovely to see you thank all. You. Bye. Have a good you. afternoon. Bye. Bye.